today it's spitting snow outside. So a little bit of light snow, the pavement's wet, and it's very cold outside. So I am staying in to make this video for you. And I wanted to talk about something that's something I've been, um, I've known about it a long time as a musician. <laughs> It was for this reason that I titled my CD that I put out that um, it's been on iTunes, but it's called My Frequency. And it was put out in 2006 before I started writing my book. I was, you know, composing and doing all of this music. So um, I named my CD My Frequency and the reason why I titled it My Frequency was to say, in essence, that I'm tuned to God's frequency instead of the world's frequency. And so that's what I had named my album. And part of the reason why is because there is this A440 Hertz tuning standard that's been kind of a mystery. Now, what does that mean if you're not a musician and you don't know? If you have a tuning fork, it's an A440 Hertz tuning standard. And you can tune your guitar and your instruments. They're all tuned to A440 Hertz. So a tuning fork, you know, you, you kind of knock it on something and then you put it on the instrument and you can hear it hum the pitch of A440. So... This is something that was kind of mysterious. I had studied some acoustics being a musician and found out that this was not always the same hertz that the musicians used to tune to. And why is this important? And it's because the Nazis, Hitler's right-hand man, Joseph Goebbels, he was a very evil man, um, and he had control over media, the arts, music, and um, film, and so he used these avenues for propaganda of the Nazis, and he was the one who wanted the tuning to change to A440. And the reason being, it's supposed to be that it causes anxiety in the body. And the Nazis thinking in this was that they could control the masses if they tuned to a frequency that created disharmony within the body, supposedly even caused people to not be well and to have anxiety within themselves. It also caused people to act out. You know, when you saw the phenomenon, you know, how people would go crazy over rock musicians, this led to all of this drug taking and everything. So I wanted to talk about the changing of the tuning standard, which had been before World War II, the orchestra tuned to A432 Hertz but the Nazis wanted it to be 440 hertz. And today, 440 hertz has been the standard ever since 1939, 1940. And ever since then, all the orchestras tuned to that. And so a lot of musicians that knew about this, they would go to the old tuning standard of A432 hertz. So I want to read this to you. Um, that helps explain exactly what happened here. 
Have you ever wondered why we tune to A440 Hertz? Many people don't give it much thought, if any at all. But while some musicians are content in keeping our current international standard used in the U.S. and several other countries, others are riled up about this mysterious number. Many different types of scales sprouted up throughout the globe, accommodating different kinds of international music, including the popular Solfeggio scale. Though its first form may have originated during biblical times, the Solfeggio scale, the traditional seven-tone scale, was Latinized and surfaced in the Middle Ages as a six-tone scale to be prevalently used by the monks in Gregorian and other religious chants, healing frequencies, and eventually it was changed and refurbished into the Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do scale that we presently use. In 1711, John Shore made a fork in the musical road when he invented the tuning fork to enable easy consistency among instruments. Tuning forks were used by many musicians in classical Europe and are still found in music classrooms today. But it wasn't until the later 1800s into the early 1900s that the unit of frequency, or Hertz, was invented by Heinrich Hertz and used to measure the pitches of tuning forks, strings, keys, and drums. In 1834, silk manufacturer Johann Schreibler created a tonometer, different than modern tonometers, used for measuring eye pressure, made of many tuning forks to determine the pitch of other sounds. One of the tonometer designs included an octave of tuning forks ranging from A220 to A440 Hz. Modern digital tuners came into the scene in the late 1930s leading up to Boss creating the first automatic chromatic tuner in 1983. And by the later 20th century, handheld tuners had specified calibration settings as well as enhanced displays and built-in metronomes. So where did we get the A440 Hertz standard from? All orchestral instruments have an A string, so tuning to A, the A above middle C, was probably the simplest thing to do, but deciding upon the pitch of this A wasn't so simple. Musicians and composers in many locations began to experiment with different tuning standards in Hertz, including whole number and decimal values, and for years there was a ton of variation. So yes, much of that classical music you've heard from the 1700s, performed and recorded in modern times, would sound quite different if you went back in time to the 1700s and listened to those same pieces. However, when traveling musicians constantly bounced around between different towns, cities, and countries, when musicians from different parts of the world collaborate, when sharing sheet music from place to place, and even in the consistency of the way instruments are crafted, many people figured it would be easier to have some kind of widely recognized standard. And though Paris, Vienna, and other cities all over Europe developed their own standards, countries like France and Italy wanted to put a national tuning standard into law. Famous Italian composer and senator of the first parliament of Italy, Giuseppe Fortunino Francesco Verdi, who had composed music in several tunings, wrote a letter in the 1880s trying to convince the governments Italian Music Commission to switch their standard to 432 hertz, feeling it was more mathematically sound than the higher-pitched proposal of A450 hertz by the city of Rome. Verdi felt higher pitches put too much strain on the music and was willing to compromise a little with France's A435 hertz, but he banned performances of his operas if anyone wanted to play them at a higher pitch. Thanks to Verdi and other proponents, Italy, France, and certain performance groups like theaters and operas throughout Europe and the United States kept their standard between a 432 hertz and 435 hertz for a while to follow, but this harmony would not last indefinitely. 
In 1910, John Calhoun Deegan, famous for the creation of many percussive instruments, and by the way, there's a Deegan company that uh, is percussion, and they make marimbas, which, by the way, are inferior in quality, in my opinion, to the Musser Ludwig brand. I've played on them. I love the Musser brand, which is my favorite to play on, but... Um, John Calhoun Deegan was able to persuade the American Federation of Musicians to use A440 Hertz as their tuning standard. But listen to this. The Nazis supported the tuning of A440 Hertz two decades later and became the first to advocate for this to become a worldwide standard. Nazi politician and Reich Minister for Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, controlled Radio Berlin and organized an international conference in 1939 to determine a standard for concert pitch. Goebbels represented Germany at the meeting where he pushed and voted for A440 Hertz. In organizing this meeting, he was, of course, in control of the guest list and not a single French composer was asked to attend. At the time, a referendum by Professor Dussault of the Paris Conservatory of 23,000 French musicians voted overwhelmingly for A432 Hertz. No wonder they weren't invited. Though A440 Hertz was agreed upon at this biased meeting shortly after it took place, World War II broke out, so the number didn't stick right away. In 1971, the proposed tuning standard was still being ignored around the world by Russia, Britain, and the Vienna Philharmonic of Austria, who used other tunings, including but not limited to A435 hertz and 425 hertz and 450 hertz. The decision at the 1939 International Conference with Goebbels Hitler's right-hand man, though unsuccessful at the time it took place, ultimately prevailed to a large extent when the International Organization for Standardization accepted A440 Hertz as the official standard pitch in 1955, which they reaffirmed in 1975, and this still stands to date. So here's where the disagreement still lies. Everyone has their own preference, though many people contributed to and partook in this number dispute, ranging from professional musicians and composers to physicists and others who held non-music related profession, there's still a lack of consensus on which frequency standard is the best. It's no secret that certain sounds and frequencies are pleasing while others make you cover your ears and still others cannot be heard by humans at all. Though all notes have resonation capability, some notes may have beneficial and attractive effects, while others may have a negative and repelling effect and others may have no effect whatsoever. On top of it all, the effects or lack thereof are different for humans, animals, insects, and plants since all have unique hearing and reception ranges and are made of diverse quantities of different elements. It is well known that the Nazis were consistently and constantly experimenting with physical and psychological manipulation to maintain and expand their control. They even went on numerous expeditions organized by the Anarabi Society to search the world, including but not limited to museums and ancient ruins, for archaeological relics and mythical objects they believed would bring power to their endeavors. Even if the science behind the Nazis' decision in supporting A440 Hertz is still not clear, they themselves clearly believed it did something in their favor, else they wouldn't have invested any time in the matter. In one study consisting of 33 volunteers, listeners were exposed to sessions of music tuned to A32 Hertz and A440 Hertz without knowledge of which frequency was being played. The A443 music resulted in a larger decrease in heart rate and respiratory rate than the A440 Hertz music.
Original Stradivarius and Cremonis from Cremona violins have been thoroughly examined for physical design properties contributing to their superior high quality sound. At a 1989 conference organized by the Schiller Institute and the Italian Harpsichordist Association in Venice, Italy, research findings were discussed in favor of a return to A432 Hertz tuning because it not only resulted in optimal sound performance on these violins, but it also sustained their life and preservation by reducing excess tension on the framework. And this is basically resounding the same concept as the physical stress factor mentioned by Verity, which can be applied to instruments as well as the human voice. Later studies in 2018 by scientists in Taiwan, such as Wang Qing Tai, associate professor at National Taiwan University's Department of Chemistry, showed that these early instruments produced sounds similar to human vocal patterns. The researchers found that the early Italian instruments produced human-like formants, the harmonic tones that correspond to resonances in the vocal tract. Specifically, the Amati violins produced formants similar to those from bass and baritone singers, while the Stradivari instruments had higher frequency formats, closer to those of tenors and contraltos. Proponents of this and other frequencies try to apply the Pythagorean theorem and other mathematical formulas to multiple frequency. Some feel certain frequencies are in tune with the universe, our brains, our souls, and a person's energy field or spiritual center. The idea of music being directly connected to the entire universe stems back to our earliest civilizations. Johannes Keebler, later 1500s to early 1600s, creator of the three Kepler's law of planetary motion, felt that each note in a major and minor scale corresponded to the point where a planet is farthest from the sun and perihelion's point where it's closest to the sun of the different planets. Well, that's interesting. Some music and sound researchers have completed studies on the physical healing benefits of certain frequencies over others in both sound and light, as well as that of certain scales. Though sound and songs in general can have beneficial and healing effects on people, and other living things, and perhaps even distant frequencies can heal specific tissue and cell types. Whether a single frequency's tuning effect applies to each individual as a whole, or all people uniformly is up for debate, since being in a state of good health is so unique to each individual. After all, we don't all exactly have the same genetics or chemical levels in our bodies. Despite all of this, the majority of people in the United States continue to adhere to the A440 Hertz standard, while others around the world steadfastly compose, play, and craft their instruments to A432 Hertz and other alternative pitches, including the Vienna Philharmonic, which tunes a bit higher than A440 Hertz. Just as in ancient times, there are also some who continue to tune based on feeling alone. And how do you feel about it is all up to you. While there is definitely more to learn on this topic, to narrow it down to one single frequency that serves as the best tuning standard for everyone seems nearly impossible. In a world that's literally made entirely of vibrations, ultimately the decision is up to the instrument manufacturers, composers, and of course, each musician. So the reason why I'm telling you this story is because ever since just before World War II, Joseph Goebbels, which he was the one who went to this meeting and wanted to have everyone tuned to A440 Hertz. The reason being is that it is said that it's this frequency that causes anxiety in the body. It causes them to be able to control and manipulate the masses and this is what happened to music ever since that time period. So let me tell you a little bit about Hitler's right-hand man, Joseph Goebbels. Now, he was the chief propagandist 
for the Nazi Party and then Reich Minister of Propaganda from 1933 to 1945. And he was one of Adolf Hitler's closest and most devoted followers, known for his skills in public speaking and his deeply virulent anti-Semitism, which was evident in his publicly voiced views. He was a very evil man, very evil. He even had um, become the chancellor for one day and then he ended his life, his wife, ended her life and they killed all of their six children with poison. He advocated progressively harsher discrimination, including the extermination of Jews in the Holocaust. It was very evil. It says that he joined the Nazi party in 1924 and worked with Gregor Strasser in its northern branch. And he was appointed Galatier of Berlin in 1926 when he began to take an interest in the use of propaganda to promote the party and its program. After the Nazis came to power in 1933, Goebbels' propaganda ministry quickly gained control over the news media, arts, and information in Nazi Germany. He was particularly adept at using the relatively new media of radio and film for propaganda purposes. Topics for party propaganda, including anti-Semitic attacks uh, and attacks on the Christian churches, and after the start of the Second World War, attempts to shape morale. So even though Goebbels was involved in the propaganda and, you know, controlling the propaganda on media, the arts, music, film, um, some people consider that this is a conspiracy and some people don't believe this, but there is allegedly something sinister and evil about the 440 Hertz. And it said that the Rockefeller Foundation had an interest in making sure the United States adopted the 440 Hertz standard in 1935 as part of a war on consciousness leading to musical cult control. And it says, tuning all music to 440 hertz turns it into a military weapon, or that it's weaponized music. The monopolization of the music industry features this imposed frequency that is hurting populations into greater aggression, psychosocial agitation, and emotional distress, predisposing people to physical illness and financial impositions, profiting the agents, agencies, and companies engaged in the monopoly. So it said that propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels insisted that on 440 hertz tuning in Germany because he believed it made people think and feel in specific ways, making them, quote, a prisoner of a certain consciousness. And if you're trying to mobilize the population for the Fuhrer, that's exactly what you want. Some people just don't believe this, no matter how much people try to say otherwise, that this is what the Nazis put in place. It says, these destructive frequencies entrain the thoughts towards disruption, disharmony, and disunity. Additionally, they also stimulate the controlling organ of the body, the brain, into disharmonious resonance, which ultimately creates disease and war. Now, some of the people tuned back to the frequency of 432 hertz. Um, Prince's recording engineer at the time said that Prince tuned to A432 hertz. And so did some of the other people like Jimi Hendrix. This resonance, this feeling within the body, within the energy and of course, the heart is like electrical component of the body, which is why when you go to the hospital for the heart condition, it's the telemetry department, which has to do with the electricity of the heart. So I was listening to Dr. Laura Sanger, and she talked about these frequencies and went into detail talking about it on a podcast. and. One of the things she said was that the 444 hertz is supposed to have frequencies in it that are healing, healing to the body, 
healing to the mind, to the heart, and with the 440 hertz that everything's tuned to now, supposedly removed these healing frequencies. And so this is why people say that all of the rock music and everything that's gone, you know, basically back to the devil controlling it, you know, has to do with this change. And this is why the Nazis wanted this A440 tuning. So I totally believe this is true. And I want to share a scripture with you. Now, you know, I have always believed, being a musician, that there are more notes in the scale than we can even hear, that there are frequencies and tones that we've never heard, because some of this is the music of creation, the music of God, and these frequencies are not heard by our ears. And that gives meaning to the scriptures. One of them is Isaiah 64, 4, that says, for the, since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. So I truly believe that when we cross over to the other side and we are with the Lord after we die in our spirits, then we will hear frequencies and sounds of song that we've never heard with our ear. And we will see things that we've never seen before, colors in the color spectrum that our eye cannot pick up in this world. And tones and sounds that we've never been able to hear with our ears. And this will open up some glorious sounds, majestic music that will overwhelm our ears and the colors in the spectrum will overwhelm our eyes. And when I say overwhelm, I don't mean in a bad way. I mean, it'll just be awe-inspiring. And let me share this scripture in 1 Corinthians 2, starting in verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So our heart, our heart is rhythmic. It's an electrical force that's beating within our chest. It's really you know the lifeblood flows through our heart and our heart has a rhythm and so when we see these things on the other side when the curse is taken off the earth and god creates a new heaven and a new earth and the new jerusalem that we'll enter we will see things on the other side that the eye hath not seen nor has the ear heard any of these sounds that are coming and it will be so glorious we will just be beside ourselves in wonder and awe in that verse goes on to say that god hath revealed them unto us by his spirit for the spirit searches all things yea the deep things of god so by the power of the holy spirit you know God is able to help us to perceive these things and see some of these things that we didn't know before because it gives us wisdom. And of course that goes on to say, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he might instruct him? But we have the mind of Messiah Christ. And so we know that at creation, God used music in the creation. He used frequencies and vibrations and harmonies and melodies in each 
Hebrew letter of the alphabet had a certain note associated with it on the musical scale. So it is said that he used music in creation. And we know that Jesus left the Passover Seder singing the Hallel, going towards the Mount of Olives with his disciples. So he was singing. Now, could it be that the Nazis tried to manipulate the, the tuning for the fact that they were always looking at cultic material and cultic things. So they would have been looking into the things of Lucifer, which is said to have been in the garden of God in the beginning and that he had pipes and timbrels and that he walked back and forth on the fiery stones. Now, does that mean stones that are on fire? No, it does not. When you have really pure gemstones, they have a fiery brilliance that emanates out of them when light shines on them. And the purer the quality of the gemstones, the more fiery radiance comes out of them. So here was Lucifer, you know, he was head of the music and there he was prancing around on God's mountain. So then he glorified himself and wants to take over God's throne. Does God sing then? Of course he does. And Dr. Sanger gave this verse, which I just love too. And it's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem because of all the things they did against the Lord. And then it talks about a restoration. So Zephaniah three sixteen says, In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not at to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. And he will joy over thee with singing. So God is the creator of the music and singing. And that was truly my first love, being a musician and singing. And people on this earth try to stop your creativeness. So some said that, you know, with the change with rock music, that that was kind of the downfall of society. Society started getting away from the family and away from, you know, gospel music and getting more into these other genres of music. Now we're supposed to praise the Lord with, you know, tambourines, high sounding cymbals, the hand drum, and um, that's what Miriam had. She had a hand drum like a tambourine with a head on it. And it didn't necessarily have to have jingles on it. But, you know, usually they were like, shaped like a hand drum. And trumpets and flutes and everything else. Stringed instruments, the harp. So all of these things were for praising God with. And probably when King David played for King Saul and it gave rest to his spirit, King David was playing in a frequency that was heavenly. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, 7, And even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? Psalm 98, 5, Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp, and the voice of a psalm. In Isaiah 5, when the Lord was admonishing the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the men of Judah, it said, Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ears, saith the Lord of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair without inhabitant. 
Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of an omer shall yield an ephah. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp, and the viol, and the tabret, and pipe, and wine are in their feasts. But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. So King David played for Saul, and it said in 1 Samuel 18, verse 10, And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand, as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand, and Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall, but David escaped his presence twice. Let me finish with 1 Samuel 16, 16. This is Saul. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. Obviously, David was tuned to a certain frequency that had healing properties. And could it be the A528 frequency? That's what some people think, that this was the frequency that God created the universe in. So these are really interesting facts about music and the scales that have been created to play music. And a lot of times in music, they will use certain Greek scales and some are uh, Mixolydian, Lydian, Phrygian, all of these are musical scales and they start on one note and go to an octave of that same note. So they kind of, you know, they don't go from C to C. They may start on a D and go to the next D. So all of these musical scales affected the body, the heart, the mind, and the Nazis thought that you could control the masses by using certain frequencies that were dissonant to the body, dissonant to nature, that caused anxiety in the person and did not allow for healing. So maybe this is what David knew on his harp that caused Saul to be healed from the evil spirit. So with that, I'll just say, good night, everyone. See ya.